Today, and video two, I'd like to speak uh, a, a few words about uh, the religious philosophical tradition uh, known as Taoism. And uh, this religious tradition, spiritual tradition, aesthetic tradition, it, 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 it's as religious as much as it is literary and artistic. It also inspires uh, political philosophies, it has inspired political philosophies, as well as great artistic movements. Taoism is perhaps has a higher profile globally than Confucianism does for people outside of the Chinese cultural sphere. And the reason being uh, is that it, it tends to stress, the it does stress a kind of um, uh, spontaneous adaptation of oneself to the course or flow of nature. The idea here is that rather than uh, forcing oneself to conform with the dictates of society, that a person will actually fulfill their potential better by becoming sensitive to the movements of nature. It's, it's as if one could learn more about how to live from observing a river or a, a wood filled with trees than one could learn from a book of rules or a law book. Um, the central to the notion of, of Taoism, one of the central ideas, is, this, is then this notion of spontaneity. Uh, but there is much, much more to Taoism. Taoism is sometimes, in these introductory uh, contexts, radically demarcated or separated from Confucianism, and they're often set up as opposites to each other. And actually, in the history of Chinese thought, these schools are more complementary than they are uh, antagonistic to each other, but they do have different emphases, that is clear, and their interaction has both uh, has softened uh, the, other, uh, the other side of this uh, kind of yin and yang uh, uh, image or symbol uh, of, uh, in which we could say uh, these two relig religious philosophical traditions are interacting with each other. Um, maybe an attempt to try to get at what really philosophically motivates Taoism, because it is, above all else, I would say, a school of philosophy, but it's a school of philosophy with a broad, uh, uh, broad reach into the other areas of human life, is the notion that meaning is context-dependent. And I'll quote uh, one translator, uh, an M. Palmer of the, of the, of the Zhuangzi, um, who writes, there, in Taoism, there is no such thing as a fact which stands apart from the context of the speaker. Some may hear relativism or nihilism there, but what I hear is that meaning is context, it's holistic, meaning is context dependent, um, and that uh, meanings can change when the context uh, shifts. Uh, so I'll give a story. Taoism is filled with wonderful stories, how to express that. So, and I'm retelling the story in a very fluid way. Uh, and uh, so there was a, um, there was a, a trainer of, uh, of animals, a, a train, there was a, a group of monkeys, and this is an old story, and maybe it doesn't fit so much today to, with our move to take animals out of such context. The story is told of a monkey trainer who uh, would give every morning to the monkeys who were being trained, I guess, to work in circuses, um, and they were given four uh, acorns as their meal in the morning and three acorns in the evening. And this was the normal routine of things. And one day the, the trainer decided to shake things up a little bit and gave three acorns in the morning and four acorns at night. And the animals, the monkeys became, uh, they were beside themselves with confusion and outrage because the situation had changed. And so the trainer, being, uh, being, being, of course, adaptable, said, okay, 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 we'll go back to the old arrangement. And the monkeys were quite content after that. And of course, really objectively speaking, little if nothing had changed. It was still seven acorns a day. I suppose one could argue that you're, you may be hungrier in the morning or in the evening, so it's better to have your four in the morning or your three in the evening. But objectively speaking, the situation hadn't really altered. 
but the context determined the meaning of the seven acorns. When the context changed, the meaning changed. And Taoism then tries to cultivate this spontaneity to changing circumstances. And, and people who are attracted to Taoism are generally tend to be more nonconformist in dress, in the way they, the, the kinds of occupations they choose. And that's a good reason why Taoists and Taoist scriptures were popular when I was a younger person in countercultural settings. You would be hard pressed to have found the Analects of Confucius uh, back in those days, uh, but you might have found, uh, you certainly would have found the Tao Te Ching. So, a little bit of history, just a bit. Um, Taoism uh, traces itself back uh, to uh, two, uh, two significant figures. One was Lao Tzu, uh, who uh, perhaps, perhaps a mythical figure, perhaps not, lived in the 6th century BCE. And uh, another figure, Zhuangzi, who lived a couple of centuries later. They were both minor officials in the court of the emperor, and they both left uh, with perhaps in a mood of dissatisfaction uh, to go off and to pursue their philosophical interests. Um, and the, there is a book associated with each figure. Lao Tzu's book is known as the Lao Tzu or the Tao Te Ching, and Zhuangzi's book is known uh, essentially as the Zhuangzi. And, uh, and, of course, these names are said differently and spelled differently depending upon who's speaking and what, what system of transliteration they're using. But um, they're not ex actually the same. They, they share a lot of common features. But Lao, Tzu, Lao Tzu's writings are, are more practical and more concerned with, with, with external affairs of the state, of politics, whereas, according to uh, some scholars, uh, Zhuangzi's philosophy is more concerned with how the individual would fit, fits into the flow of nature. And as a consequence, uh, Zhuangzi has had a, a much greater influence upon the arts uh, uh, than uh, perhaps a, a Lao Tzu has had. Now, one way of talking about Taoism in the past in, in introductory co courses was to distinguish between a so-called philosophical Taoism, which was the pure tradition unsullied by the ritualism of everyday Taoism, and the other Taoism, a religious Taoism, um, which apparently was a corrupted form of the tradition more concerned with uh, rituals and, and uh, magical practices. But recent scholarship has said that this distinction, this division between the two is actually quite artificial. And I, I won't I won't take any much time to go into that, but I just want people to be aware that the, this, this is important for understanding Taoism as a living religious tradition on the ground uh, in China, in Taiwan, and in communities where Chinese uh, medicine and Chinese culture and Chinese religious practices are prevalent, that the Taoism that you're likely to encounter actually will be a blending of these two streams, the high philosophical stream and the other practices, the many myriad yoga-like practices, uh, Ayurveda-like practices of uh, of, of, of uh, of Taoism. Um, one idea, another idea that is uh, central to Taoism is the notion of unlearning. If, if, Confucian, if Confucius was concerned with inculcating appropriate models of behavior in his students, the Taoist approach was, if that got too uh, overdone, was to unlearn those rules. So this is a central Taoist idea of unlearning. It's related to spontaneity. After all, the rules of etiquette, even Confucius would have agreed, are not encoded into the nature of reality itself. They're context-dependent. They can change. And so the Taoist sees that, this, that these rules are, in fact, context-sensitive and uh, then is able to uh, sort of change them or go about, go beyond them, or go behind them, or go beside them. And this is the, uh, this notion of unlearning is connected with uh, spontaneity, and ultimately it's connected to the notion of a central idea in Taoism of wu wei, of actionless action, of sort of acting without really uh, doing anything, just letting what needs to be done to be accomplished without any uh, Without, without any sweat, without the exertion that comes from hyper-willing hyper things, from volition. 
and the story is told of a of a of a of a butcher. Uh, I'm a vegetarian of a butcher who. Uh, was able effortlessly to separate the bone and the meat uh, in, his, in, in his work because of the great skill uh, that, uh, that he had. Um, and so uh, I think I'd like to end, however, with uh, a couple of lines from a great uh, a Taoist religious text that shows Buddhist, Confucian, and, and, and Taoist influences, just a line or two. It's from the Tract of the Quiet Way. And as it says in, in that text, he, the person who wants to exp expand the field of happiness, let that person lay the foundation of this on the bottom of their heart. And, um, and, and so I, with that, I'd like to end because it, it expresses a very gentle and very practical spirituality.